Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk today. And thank you all so much for being here and listening to me. Because uh, um, actually, uh, I'm from Vivaltus, I'm the director, and we, have, we are with 10 people, and we have this passion to translate science, uh, core science, actually towards the industry. And we do this in very close collaboration with many industries and also universities. So it's really a pleasure to be here. And for this, actually, what we do, our core business is actually that we use C elegance uh, wet lab testing, uh, and we combine this with data science in such a way that we can be better predictive for effects in higher organism and help to reduce the number of, uh, of mammalian testing for uh, with regards to effects of compounds and herbal products and uh, other UVCBs uh, complex products. And that's not only because it's so expensive to do and we focus in this project on neurotox and development and reprotox and the, and that's not only because it's so expensive and so time consuming, but also I get a lot of comments from industrial uh, collaborators that their rat and rabbit data gives really different results and that they are really with their hands in their hair, literally to put it in Dutch, uh, bad English, that they don't know what to do with it and how to how to proceed. So what you're actually looking for and what we are all looking for, I also heard today, is actually how can we with this modern technology that's available now and all this omics, uh, all this knowledge from chemistry, how can we integrate this all to in new approaches that can integrate with all this other data. Um, so I want to take you and introduce you to C elegance um, and I put you down Michelle um, uh, and C elegance is a small nematode that is only one millimeter in size and you can see it here on my screen and, and I hope you can see my arrow pointing at it. It, it has uh, many organs so it has reproductive system, it has muscles, it has a nervous system that consists out of 302 neuronal cells that you can see labeled here in green in the bottom picture. Um, and it actually um, has a, a short generation time, it's only like uh, two weeks uh, and after three days it's mature and it gets progeny, it's hermaphrodite, so it's male and female at the same time. And we know everything about this organism and you can see in the right top you see an embryo and all the cells in the embryo dividing. And if you look to that image, you can actually see the time uh, actually passing by. So we, we have mapped, or not me, but other people have mapped all the cell divisions in this nematode to create a whole uh, from one fertilized egg cell towards a whole nematode, including all the, 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 the fates that these cells will become and how they will behave. And it has been studied, this nematode, since the 1960s. In the universities, it's a really well-known model. And that means that's a lot of technology available. There's many tools available that you might use. There are mutants for almost every gene in the genome. There's reported genes, like you see here with this nervous system, that, that can highlight every cell type, but also almost every protein uh, in, in that is available in that organism. And I think in that way only already is very useful to implement in, in this, in this uh, in testing of, of, of botanical safety. But most of all, and what's most important is that it has a conserved cell biology and genetics when you compare it to higher organism, because no one cares about the nematode itself. We care about how you can translate that to other organisms. And I want to show this, this picture I always show because it's so beautiful. You see in the top panels, you see actually the healthy eye of a human, a mouse and a zebrafish. Uh, and you see the head of a nematode in which you see the mouth on the left and nematodes do not have eyes. Now, if you mutate the genes that are involved in eye development, and in this case, it's the Hox homeobox gene PAC6, then humans cannot form a normal healthy eye. The same is true for mouse and the same is true for zebrafish. So you need this genetic information in order to produce a proper eye development. The nematode that does not have eyes does also have this genetic information. So what does it do here in early evolution? And when you knock out this gene, you actually see that nematodes get a misshapen head. So they get a bulgy head. So this the region, so the, the function of these genes and nematodes is actually to create head morphology, where later in evolution, higher in evolution, you, it, they, this, this genetic information is important for eye development. So you can already see that this small nematode of one millimeter, like what has it to do with humans or higher organisms, already has so much evolutionary conserved information that is still relevant for higher organisms. Now, how can you use this organism for testing? Well, there's, I will just give you a few examples because they're endless. 
Here you have a mo movie in which you see the nematodes eating bacteria. And if you look at my pointer, you can see actually the pharyngeal valve going up and down. So you see this nematode actually swallowing food. So you can actually very simply, it's the most simple test, everyone can do it, is look at eating behavior. Uh, what you can also see um, is that you can measure fat, for example. So on the top panel, you see normal body fat. On the bottom panel, you see reduced fat levels. And this might, for example, be nice if you look at endocrine disruptors. You can visualize sperm. So you see the head here on the left, and, and you see in the, in, in the picture below, you see these two sperm regions highlighted by a staining. You can look at oocyte development and fertilization. You can also look at nervous system, and you can look at how actually the nervous system functions during development or after development and this is a simple test you see a, an agar plate here in the in the in, in in this picture you put the nematodes which are the white dots in the picture in the middle and then you put the smelling agent either on the left side in this case it's ethanol or and on the right side in this case it's butanol and you wait one hour and you see where the nematodes actually how they migrate where are they going to are they attracted by a smell or not and here you can see that ethanol and butanol sort of similarly attracts nematodes. So the white dots in the left in the circle are sort of the equal amounts as on the right in the butanol. But this you can train. So you can actually learn these nematodes that only when there's butanol in the environment, there is food. And nematodes are not dumb. So as soon as they have been trained, they know I have to go to the butanol because there is food. So you see now they're all on the left side because in this case we put butanol in the left side. They all go there. So you can really train them and learn them. And that's a way to also assess, for example, neur neuronal effects of compounds. This is a serotonergic neurons in the nose that are in, in, responsible for, me, for actually um, uh, the food response. And you see how beautifully you can highlight them by GFP, fluorescent, green fluorescent protein, actually a living, living nematode. So you can monitor that while nematodes are still alive and just moving around. And then one final example of what you could do when you use these nematodes for screening for effects of compounds. Here you see a, re, a gene that is a very important stress integrator, the FOXO gene, it's called in humans and it's DAF16 in nematodes. It actually integrates stress signal. And as soon as there's stress, which could be heat stress, oxidative stress, uh, all other kinds of stress, this, this protein actually migrates to the nucleus. And you can see that in the bottom picture and the head of the nematodes is, is here to the left um, and here to the right. Uh, and then you see the, the nuclear accumulation of this reported gene. And this transcription factor because it's a transcription factor activates then downstream gene expression that protects the animal actually again from this stress. So all these kind of different endpoints you can measure. Well, we have, so the, the most important question is then, is C. elegans now a predictive test system to assess development and reprotox or neurotox? And we have been studying this for, for many years now, and it started already in 2012 uh, by an NC3R from the UK government funded project until still it's ongoing by a, a European Union funded project. Uh, and, and there's a lot to say about it. And actually the conclusion is it's, it's, it's a very nice nice system, a nice tool, uh, and, and we did all kinds of things uh, from uh, adverse outcome pathway mapping to metabolomics to different exposure methodologies, and we have a final symposium on the 2nd of December, so please feel free to just let me know and then I can invite you to join and we can tell you all the details of this work, but for now it would go too far, so I, I have to skip this a little bit and I will just end with one slide showing you that at least uh, at, uh, that we feel that C. elegans is a very good system for development and reprotox. This is a very old picture, which I should have updated and I didn't, but what you can see here is, is one of the first studies we did when we tested 31 compounds that actually are positive for development and reprotox in mammals. You can see that C. elegans actually picks up 27 of those. So it has very sensitive, it's a sensitivity of 87%. But this, of course, depends on what length of exposure you have, what timing uh, of exposure during development, and also how you expose them. So the exposure methodology is also very essential. And other groups actually found similar things. So in one group, they found similar specific sensitivity, uh, and other group found it differently because they just did, used a different approach. So this doesn't tell you everything. Uh, Timing, length, and exposure methodology, that's what we learned is actually key for having a proper effect. 
And then we also realized something else in all these years of study. It's actually the phenotypes, so the defects or the effects of compounds or herbal ingredients that are, you can actually measure in this nematode, they are really truly true effects. So you, we don't look at per se at gene changes, we look at the overall phenotypes because that really is reflective. You know that there should be an effect. And with regards to this, and we build a uh, herbal database in which we actually have uh, 902,000 herb, 9,200 herbs in there, and 160,000 of their compounds, the way they are, have activities, cause phenotypes, if there's information of the mode of action, and we have connected all those with the aim to better predict can we predict if you give a herbal uh, extract or if you give compounds or if you give combinations of compounds, can we actually predict what you expect for phenotypes in different types of organisms? And the reason why this is so important for us working with C. elegans in the lab is that in, in case you expect, for example, um, uh, a certain phenotype, like for example, a neuronal connection, but you don't look at this, you look at progeny number, you will not find it. And then you might conclude that C. elegans actually is a bad test system. Well, it's actually not, but you just looked at the wrong endpoint. So for us, it's really important to be aware of what should we actually look at? What should we study? Uh, what do we predict in order to also have the right readout? Because I just showed you there are thousands of essays you can do, but if you don't look at it, you don't see it. Uh, you don't see if there's an effect. So we have mapped all these phenotypes now, and they come from different organisms. They can come from C. elegans, they can come from zebrafish, they can come from mouse or rat or rabbit studies, and all these phenotypes we have collected together. But I also showed you already that if you see a phenotype for example, head morphology in, in the nematode, it can be connected to eye development in a higher organism. So how now do you connect all these phenotypes together? So we also invested very much in phenomics. So we map actually phenotypes back to, if you have a phenotype in different organisms, what genes actually could be responsible, what pathways could be responsible for causing this phenotypic effect. So we actually did a sort of reverse approach. So instead of going from RNA up to phenotypes, we went from phenotypes down. So if you have, a, for example, a, a mouse with some kind of effect, how could that be caused? Which pathways could be involved? And of course, we also take some of the other way around approaches because you need them both to make the proper picture. And we have established um, a, a data analytics framework, and we are at this moment publishing, and it will be available also on GitHub if you're interested, um, which can, in which you can integrate different phenotypes of different species, and they can be really different from each other. So all the effects a herb, for example, might have in different te te test systems, and you also might include want to include cell-based data, and that and that that data analytics can then translate then to all this information to to uh, consensus pathways, so make actually a mechanistical uh, a pathway pipeline that is most likely and a little bit less likely according to the data you put in. So that means no data, bad prediction. So the more data you put in, the better it can actually predict how actually a certain herb or compound or ingredient might actually cause its effect. And why is this nice? Because if we use the data that is already out there and there is already so much published about herbs ingredients compounds and their effects if we can map those two pathways then you might also be able to predict actually what you should test in if you use an, a new alternative methodology no matter what system you might use so you can have a more dedicated testing instead of just counting for example progeny number in nematodes but more more refined more fitting with the previous data and taking into account the whole scientific scientific spectrum. So this is something we have running at this moment. And it looks like this. So we have made sort of um, a dashboard how it looks like. And this is just the compound benzoic acid. So there's some chemical information on the left. Then you have some information on the different uh, uh, mammalian species. And in this case, there is one toxicity report in rats. The rest is not toxic. This is the amount of, of reports. There's some cell assays that have been associated with this compound. And, and, and that has been sort of uh, uh, regarded uh, having toxic outcomes. And they're, in this case, four zebrafish phenotypes. And then 
you can play around with it. You can also look at the Vivaldi's website, which is, explains it a little bit more in depth. You can then look around how we do it. And then we translate all this information together based on statistics into mechanisms and pathways that you can select and play around with. Okay, these phenotypes I do not want to take into account and these I do want to take in account, etc. So it will be uh, coming soon. And then why is this important? Uh, one more time. Uh, because, for example, if you uh, if you have an effect, if you influence the AHR signaling pathway, which of course is very known in toxicology, uh, in mouse you can then find abnormal sleep behaviors, cholesterol changes in the cholesterol uh, effect, and here an auditory uh, auditory effects, um, and these are already very pleiotrophic effects of one pathway in one species. But now, if you mutate the same pathway or disrupt in C. elegans, what you actually see is that you get quite different phenotypes. So it's the same pathway, it's conserved evolutionary biology, but now you find all kinds of nervous system effects like neuronite connectivity, uh, neuronal cell fate specification, chemotaxis, so the way it responds to something in the outside, the, the smell, for example. So in this case, if you don't look at the right thing, you don't also get an answer on your question, and then you what well, we really would like to bring all these methodologies together. So what are we planning for the Botanical Safety Consortium? We already have some results and I'm hesitating to show them today because we are still discussing about them and we would like to um, maybe first present them to a smaller group. But what we would like to do or what we do is we, we, we test this, uh, this herbal products in C. elegans for development and reprotox using these assays that you can see here, uh, as well as for neurotoxicity. So there's some straightforward, simple assays. At the same time, we'll, we use our herb paths to see what would we predict if we would have all the, all the freedom to, to play around. Um, and then we hope that maybe we can do this while this project is continuing or maybe uh, while it's ending, maybe collect the data to put it all together in this dart parts framework to see actually uh, if we can map effects of certain herbs towards sort of common molecular mechanisms. So that was what I had as my presentation. So the finalizing slide, I think the added value of C. elegans in this, in this consortium is the fact that it's an organism and it has different tissues that communicate with each other. There's, for example, a gut brain axis and that is active in C. elegans and that has been shown. Uh, there's signaling, there's a complex behavior, things that you cannot measure in the cell. So if you combine this knowledge of cell assays and C. elegans, you have really added value. Um, we will use it for uh, uh, development and reprotox and neurotoxicity in this project, and we will see if we can with our HerbPods module. It's it's all still very new. We're also writing this down to um, as in a manuscript whether we can really predict also things and and use the dark parts to help assist in a mechanistical model. So thank you for your attention. That was what I wanted to share with you for now. Perfect. Thank you. That was a really fabulous presentation. I think too, you know, we're teasing the results. So it's definitely for the listeners on today, watch the space. We'll continue to present these as they come out and at meetings and in future in publications. Um, so we have time for a couple questions. There's one question from Ahmed in the chat that applies to your talk and to some of the other talks, but asking about basically prepping the samples. So he, they asked, um, a lot of the dietary supplements contain herb powders and aren't always extracts. Are there any in vitro test systems or C. elegans which can be used for testing the herbal powder itself or do you have to make an extract? Oh, that's a very good question. So um, for now, we, we always make extracts um, because C. elegans lives in a watery environment, so uh, we can add the powder, but then what does it mean if C. elegans cuts in contact with this powder? It suddenly has a very highly concentrated substance that it's in touch with. Well, so, so to, to be all, in order to spread it and to dilute it in an equal manner, to give all these nematodes the same amount, we do have to solve it in a way. So, uh, but we do realize that with botanicals, there's hydrophobic compounds, there may be volatile compounds. So there's all these different types of compounds. And we have spent a lot of work to actually optimize the testing strategy. So we can use glass files, closed systems, uh, in liquid base, we can do it in agar, we can feed, we shall let the nematodes eat the, the substance. So these are all choices. And 
um, for the botanical safety, we, 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 we made a choice to put it in the agar and let them so in this way expose it. Whether it would be the best for all constituents, probably not. Uh, but it's, it's all a matter of choices. It's like if you have a botanical uh, um, uh, uh, powder, how do you solve it? In which solvent do you use? How much do you give? So there's all these choices you have to make. So, uh, but we do have good experience in this way also. So, yeah. Yeah. So no, you have to solve it. I'm sorry, that was the long answer to a short question. No, I appreciate that. I think it's something too, you know, where we made the extracts for these and a lot of people are putting them in a solvent. That's where we're starting, but it's come up in all the groups, you know, what if it's in ethanol instead of DMSO? What if it's in methanol? What if it's in PBS? I think there's lots of questions to still answer that once we get a yeah. sense of how the assays are performing, we could adapt. Yes, and it it might, Connie, it might make a difference the solvent you use because Absolutely. we know that it does. So that's why actually I was getting touched back to you. So can we maybe use the same solvent that is also used in the other essay? So at least you have this comparable approach of exposure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Um, one other question, and I think for time this will be the last one. But Olaf Kelbert asked about the differences um, of ADME, specifically metabolism especially since in humans, a lot of times it's the microbiota that will metabolize some of the constituents? Yeah, that's a very important question. Um, and it's true, uh, metabolism in some ways, it, it, for example, P450s are there, the CYP1 class of P450s is lacking in C. elegans, but it has other P450s that can take over that role. Uh, if you talk about the microbiota, uh, it's true. We feed C. elegans with only one food source, which is OP50, the sort of the standard lab bacteria that it eats. So it doesn't have a very complex microbiome. Um, on the other hand, it's a beautiful organism to play with the microbiome because you can sort of synchronize it and make it really clean without any kind of microbiome there. You can feed it anything you want. So you can create your own microbiome, but that's a whole study on itself. Uh, and so it's not a way to go now, uh, but it is something that you need to be really aware of, because if you have the wrong metabolism, then you might measure the wrong outcomes. So it's something to take into consideration. So it's a very important point, actually. Great. Thank you. 